الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى bless this ummah with the preservation of the book of Allah and part of the preservation of the book of Allah includes the preservation of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun it says that we have sent down this reminder because it's not only uh, a book for this ummah but it's also a reminder for those ummah that went before us of how far they've de- deviated the Quran itself is muhayman it is an overseer of the previous deens the Judaic deen, the Christian deen and all those deens that we don't even know their names because there were other traditions Allahu alam about Buddhism, Hinduism uh, if they were prophetic traditions initially or not but the Quran lets people know where they stand one of the aspects of the sunnah that is fascinating and part of the fascination is the fact that the Dajjal is not mentioned uh, clearly in the Quran some of the scholars have found uh, implicit uh, verses but there is no actual mention of the word Dajjal in the Quran al Masih al-Dajjal but there are many hadith in which the Dajjal is mentioned and the Imam al-Awza'i considered it part of the prayer to say at the end of the Tahiyyah that you, you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min fitnat al-mahya'i wal mamat wal masih al-dajjal that you actually seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the tribulation of the masih al-dajjal and the Prophet sallallahu said in a hadith where he talks about the five things that human beings wait for uh, wealth al-ghina al-mutri the wealth that uh, people transgress and sudden death and sickness and doting old age the last one he mentioned uh, that he mentioned the Masih al-Dajjal the Masih al-Dajjal that will come at the end of time sharru fitnatin yuntadhar this is the evilest of all of the tribulations that is being waited for and all of these hadith would indicate the importance in understanding the nature of the Dajjal and in understanding also the implications that it holds for the Muslim Ummah the Prophet ﷺ told us in a hadith I have uh, mentioned no Prophet has come except that he warned his people of the Dajjal there is no Prophet from all of the Prophets some say 124,000 Allahu Alam with their number there is no Prophet except that he warned his people of the Masih al-Dajjal and he says but I will tell you something about the Masih al-Dajjal that no Prophet was given this information no Prophet was given this information before me and he said that he is A'war وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَارِ He is one-eyed and your Lord is not one-eyed this is an extraordinary piece of information He is one-eyed and your Lord is not one-eyed and this is the definitive statement about the Masih al-Dajjal because this is the contribution of the Prophet ﷺ in warning his Ummah about the nature of al-Masih al-Dajjal now just to look a little bit at the words the Christians have a tradition of what they call the Antichrist and the word anti in Greek means instead of as well as opposed to it means instead of or in place of in, in classical Greek Christos in classical Greek means the anointed one where they get Mashiach in Hebrew and we say al Messiah in Arabic which comes from a word Masaha which means to anoint to wipe over something of this nature the Messiah is what they call it was an ism fa'il which is a can be active or passive the ulama have debated about what it means that the Isa alayhi salam is called al Messiah some say it means because he traveled he was an itinerant he never stayed in one place at one time he was a, a messenger who went to different places constantly in where he was in Palestine he moved about and he never took an abode as a permanent resting place part of the and, and I want to talk about that later but just to look at this linguistic analysis of the word Messiah al-Dajjal 
Some of the Muslims called it later Masih al-Dajjal, which is from Masih. The Masih, which is in the Hadith, Masih al-Dajjal. The Masih can also mean an anointed one, which has the idea that the Greeks took Christos from the Jewish concept of the Messiah. That there would one be coming, the Jews believed that there would be a Messiah that would come and bring them the truth towards the end of time. Isa alayhi salam, when he came, as we know, he was rejected. فَآمَنَتْ طَائِفَةٌ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلٌ وَكَفَرَتْ طَائِفَةٌ فَأَيَّدْنَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا عَلَىٰ عَدُوِّهِمْ فَأَصْبَحُوا الظَّاهِرِينَ Allah says at the end of Surah Al-Saf, in the Quran, that a group of Bani Israel believed in Isa alayhi salam, and a group of Bani Israel disbelieved in Isa. So this is a clear indication from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Isa alayhi salam's message first of all was to Bani Israel. And this is something he said, Ya Bani Israel, inni rasulullah ilaykum. مصدقا لما بين يدي من التوراة ومبشرا برسول يأتي من بعده اسمه أحمد This is a clear indication of the message of Isa alayhi salam I am a messenger to you Ya Bani Israel And he calls them Ya Bani Israel which is unique amongst the messengers in the Quran who call their people Ya Qawmi If you look in the Quran there is a constant reiteration of Ya Qawmi and this is what they call in the Arabic like a ta'lif or ta'nis when the Arabs want to uh, s- tell somebody that you know I'm with you they say Ya Akhil Arab Oh brother Arab in other words we're brothers there's ukhuwa between us and the Prophet sallallahu used this terminology and this is something the Muslims used as a way of binding the hearts Ya Akhil Arab I'm an Arab like you I want something good for you. This is not like racism or something. It's simply that I'm from your people. We have a blood tie that is a strong tie. And this is something the prophets used this technique. And this is one of the reasons why the Prophet ﷺ was sent first to the Arabs. And then to the rest of humankind. And he is first an Arab. He's sent to the Arab people in with an Arabic tongue. And then he's also a messenger to the rest of people. The first people he has to warn is his Ashira, his own family. And then his tribe, the people of, of Quraysh. And then to the extension, the people of the Arabian Peninsula. And then to the rest of the peoples of the earth. And this is the he is unique from the prophets and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam in that he is the universal prophet he has this unique status isa alaihi salam is not a universal prophet he was sent specifically to bani israel as a reformer he was sent with some additions addendums to the torah musaddiqan lima bani yadayya min torah i am confirming what i have with the torah which is the book that was given to musa alaihi salam so he confirmed the book but he has some changes and this is the affair of the Rasul. But he has a second message. So he says, Ya Bani Israel, unlike in the ayahs previous to that, when Musa alayhi salam says, Ya Qawmi, Lima tu'dhunani wa qad ta'lamuna anni Rasulullah ilaykum. O oh my people. Isa alayhi salam says, Ya Bani Israel, O oh children of Israel. The wisdom in that is that Isa alayhi salam is not from Bani Israel. He's Ruh Allah. He's not from Bani Israel because in the Arabic language, Qawm, your father has to be from those people. If your father is not from those people, you are not from that Qawm. You see, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء. Allah after saying a people should not mock another people and women should not mock other women because Qawm is the fathers of a people. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Wasallam said, Ibn al-Ukht al-Qawm minhum. And this was a way of reminding people that, it, it, that although the father in the Arabic language, Qawm is for the fathers, he was allowing this man to stay amongst them. In other words, we can trust the akhwan. That the, the maternal side of a family is trustworthy. So Isa does not say, Ya Qawm. He says, Ya Bani Israel. And he called them to a teaching. The teaching was that they confirmed the teaching of Musa alayhi salam and that they know that there's a messenger coming after and his name is Ahmed. Which is very interesting that the Quran uses the word Ahmed, not the word Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The word Ahmed is the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the heavens. This is a ghaybi knowledge that Isa alayhi salam was given of the messenger of Allah and it needs the most praised one. 
Now if you look in the uh, Greek dictionary, the Muslims like uh, Ahmed Didad and other Muslims have uh, indicated that the word paraclete is an actual perversion of the word uh, paraclete, which means the praise one. But if you look at the word in Greek, even the word that exists now in their gospel according to John, the word itself, its first and primary meaning according to classical Greek lexicons is the intercessor, al mushaffiq the one who intercedes for a people. That is the maqam of Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is his maqam in the akhirah. He is Ahmad in the akhirah because he is the intercessor of humankind. He intercedes for the believers. This is his maqam alayhi wa sallam. لا يشفع عنده إلا بإذني. No one intercedes in the presence of Allah except with His permission, and the first given permission to intercede is the Prophet ﷺ. Bani Israel, a group of them believed, and a group of them disbelieved. But then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says an extraordinary thing: فأيدنا الذين آمنوا على عدوهم. We gave strength and victory to those who believed. Of the Messiah, Ibn Maryam, those who believed, we gave them victory over their enemies, and they became the Zahirin. In, the, in this verse, there are three verses in the Quran that are mentioned, very similar, Kafirun, Mushrikun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huwa alladhi arsala rasuluhu bideen al-haqqi, bideen al-haqqi liyudhiruhu. Three times it's mentioned in the Quran. From the Muslim perspective, there are three false or uh, altered ways of worshipping Allah. There's the way of the Nasara, there's the way of the Yahud, and there's the way of the Mushrikeen. This is how Islam has demarcated beliefs. Islam will be manifest over these three traditions as it has in the past and it will sow it towards the end of time. The word that they asbahu zahirin, they became manifest. This did not happen in the lifetime of Isa alayhi salam. If you look at the history of Isa alayhi salam, his, his uh, prophetic uh, movement and his prophetic message was not fully implemented. A group of Bani Israel believed in him, but a group of them plotted with the Romans against his people, and eventually they were actually massacred and wiped out in 60 AD. And this is all, you can study this in the history. There were a group of early Christians called the Ebionites, and they were a Semitic Christian. They were Jewish people who had embraced the message of Isa a.s. They were waiting for somebody to come after. And this is in their books. Fascinating uh, information of the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you know about this, the Dead Sea Scrolls were some books that some uh, poor Bedouin people found in the caves in Qumran, near, just outside near the Dead Sea. And they went and sold them to some Armenian traders. And the Armenians sold them to some uh, Orthodox priests who sold them. They're all out for money. Everyone's trying to make more money. And they uh, eventually got sold to the Catholic Church. The Nag Hammadi Library was a library that was dis discovered in 1947. The Nag Hammadi Library, within less than three years, was completely translated and published. Unlike the Dead Sea Scrolls, over 40 years have passed since they were discovered and they have yet to be fully disclosed to the scholars. There have been major complaints by biblical scholars in universities all over the world that the Israeli government, in complicity with the Catholic Church, did not allow these manuscripts to be examined by scholars. And we have to ask why. What, why is it that the Nag Hammadi library that was found in Egypt, which was actually a much larger volume of work, was translated within three years and published for the scholars all over the world to examine and look at, which included Apocrypha, it included the Gospel according to Thomas, it included the Infancy Gospels, which confirm stories in the Qur'an that uh, they did not have sources for. These people, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are part of a movement, some say from the Essenes, but there were a group of Christians that were Jewish people, following the way of Isa and waiting for a prophet to come after Isa alayhi salam. 
If you look in the gospel, the remnants of them, there's much talk about the kingdom of God is at hand. And he, the, the kingdom of God that's being talked about in the gospels was not the next world. It was in this world. It's very clear in the gospels that the kingdom of God is at hand and it's in this world. The verse in the Qur'an, according to our, uh, our ulama, the commentary of this verse, those people that were given victory over their enemies, in other words, over those who rejected the Isa alayhi salam, were the Muslims. And Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu, is the leader of those Muslims that came into Palestine and liberated Palestine. They confirmed the message of Isa alayhi salam, to the Christians and confirmed the truth of Isa's mission to the Jews of that time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested them over the enemies of Isa alayhi salam and over those who had falsely interpreted the teachings of Isa alayhi salam. And so this is one of the, uh, the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this ummah is to clarify for the other peoples who Isa was, which is one of the wisdoms of why the Messiah is in, in, in the Muslim tradition, although it's not mentioned in the Qur'an explicitly, nor is it mentioned in any sahih hadith uh, with, with uh, exp- uh, explicitness. There are many weak hadith about the Mahdi, but there are many uh, hadith also, the sahih hadith that indicate that Isa alayhi salam will come at the end of time. Imam Tahawi mentions this in his aqidah, it was considered to be the acceptable position of the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah. Although there have been Muslims historically, including Imam Khaldun, that rejected the idea of a Mahdi, believed they were fabricated hadith. There have been these differences of opinion. But the dominant opinion of the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah is that Isa alayhi salam and the Mahdi would come at very similar times, the Mahdi preceding them in the hadith that's again not a clear hadith. Kayfa antum idha. إِذَا نَزَرَ فِيكُمْ عِيسَ بِنُ مَرْيَمُ وَإِمَامَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ How will you be when Isa alayhi salam comes again and your imam is from you? The indication there is Imam al-Mahdi. And he comes, the Bayt al-Maqdis, and kills the Messiah al-Dajjal. Isa alayhi salam will kill the Messiah al-Dajjal in Bayt al-Maqdis according to these hadith. Now the hadith which are called hadith al-Malahim, hadith al-Fitan, hadith akhir al-Zaman. There's been a book published, it's a translation of Ibn Kathir's book from al-Bidai wa Nihaya, which is his tariqh called The Signs of the End of Time. And Muslims very interested in this subject. These signs of the end of time... Some of them are very difficult to to discern, literally what is being said, what is the meanings. Part of the the difficulty, I believe, is that the Prophet ﷺ was speaking according to the understanding of the people of his age about things that they had no frames of reference for. There were no frames of reference. These people did not understand airplanes. They did not understand uh, phones, cellular phones, and, and uh, beepers, and these type of things. It's very difficult. There's a hadith that says, in the end of time, and this is a sound hadith, in the end of time, a man would leave his house. يَخْرُجَ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ فَتُخْبِرُهُ فَخَذُهُ بِمَا أَحْدَثَ أَهْلُهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ A man will leave his house, and his thigh will tell him what was happening in his house after he left the house. Now we know in the language of the Arab, the Arabs will call something by a thing that it's attached to. In other words, if if somebody had a phone on their thigh, then the Arabs could actually say, أَخْبَرَتْهُ فَخِذُهُ And he means the thing that was on his thigh. This is very common in the Arabic language, to call a thing by a thing that is near, or to call a hole by the part. His, hair, his head, it literally says his head turned gray in the Qur'an, Zakariya alayhi salam. But it wasn't his head that turned gray, it was his hair. But the Qur'an uses the whole to indicate the part. So this is part of the Arabic language. So he said, he also said that a man, his, the shiraku na'lihi satukallimuhu, the, the strap, the thong of his sandal will speak to him. He said that the jamadat, that, that uh, inanimate things would speak. Uh, it, there, there's a saying, it's not a hadith, but it's mentioned centuries ago in the books. إِذَا نَطَقَ الْحَدِيدِ وَسَادَ الْعَبِيدِ إِذَا نَطَقَ الْحَدِيدِ وَسَادَ الْعَبِيدِ وَقَرُبُ الْبَعِيدِ فَانْتَذَرَ الْوَعِيدِ This is something I've seen a long time ago. When, when metal speaks... When metal speaks and the uh, 
uh, the slaves, the low people rule. And this is from that, they're taking it, drawing it from the hadith, the, this proverb. They're drawing it from the hadith. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, in the end of time, the lowest people would become the rulers. The lowest people would become the rulers. And he said in a hadith, لا يسار الناس يغربلوا The people will continue to be sifted out by a sieve. The people will be continue to be sifted out by the sieve until لا يبقى من الناس إلا الحذارة That nothing remains of people except the, the dregs, the stuff you throw out. Right? And this is one of the signs of the end of time. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يكون أسعد الناس لكع بن لكع The end of time will not come until the happiest of people is لكع بن لكع which is an Arabic expression for somebody who has no uh, nothing, no origin, no uh, no nasab, no irb, nothing. He's just a low لكع بن لكع. That's what the Arabs say, لكع. Like he's worthless. And this would be one of the signs of the end of time when you have people uneducated uh, prancing about the earth. These rock stars, movie stars, the lowest type dregs of the society, prostitutes and, and these type of things. They become happy. They become the wealthy people. They become the ones, all these things. This is one of the signs of the end of time. That, that metal would speak and these low people would become the rulers. And he said, and the near, the far would become near. You see, for instance, if, for, to fly from the United States, it take you 12 hours from California, 12 hours. This is a journey that took years, literally years, not that long ago, less than 100 years ago. It, it would take you a very long time to make. Now people complain, the plane's late, it's a half hour late. People complain, like people with these machines, for, like people that ha work at their school on a 486, you know, computer line, have computers come to England yet? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> American think that, you know, that it's all happening there, and, and everybody else is in the Stone Age. And this is the Stone Age. You know, Rajim means stoned. Everybody's stoned now, right? But this, this uh, computer they have is a 486. If they get used to it, they go home and they have a 286, what they call a dinosaur now, right? Because it's like two years old or something like that. And then they complain and kick it because it's too slow, right? I mean, this is the thing. Or the, the copy, the photocopy machine. It used to take people uh, hours to transcribe a piece of paper. Now they kick the photocopy machine because this is all part of the disease of the end of time. There's no sabr. People have lost sabr. So the, the farness and nearness, the, near, the far thing becomes near. You can go now to Mecca from the ends of the earth and be there in uh, a few hours. A trip that people used to take with great difficulty and oftentimes risking their lives. From Morocco they would have to go and pass through uh, some treacherous places where they had brigands, uh, Muslim uh, brigands, right? Quta'at-turuq, things like this. Very difficult for people to travel. Now they get on a plane and they go and, and it's interesting because Allah's deen by its nature is tamhiz, purification. In the old days, they got on a plane, they, they got on the caravan and it was a punishment. The whole way of going to Hajj was in preparation. And so people had a very difficult time. When they got there, the hujjaj, the, the people living in Mecca used to come out of the city. And they would vie over the hujjaj to get them to come and stay in their houses. This is the way. So once you got to Mecca, suddenly you were in paradise. People who had, now we see photographs, pictures of Kaaba. People who'd never seen Kaaba. And suddenly they were in Mecca after spending a year on a very arduous journey. And they were in Mecca and the people of Mecca were embracing them, feeding them, taking care of them. Now, the, the adab is easy to get there. Once you get there, then all the problems start. You see, it's the opposite now. It's the exact opposite. You spend four days in Hajj and the Muslim, it's unbelievable. The Adab. And, and it does indicate our state as an Ummah. The five prayers each day indicate the state of the Ummah, right, in the community level. 
the local neighborhood. You see who prays at Fajr, who prays at Isha. It lets you know how the, the neighbor, the health of the neighborhood. And then you see Jumu'ah lets you know the health of the community, how your community is doing. But Hajj lets you know how the Ummah is doing. It gives you an indication of the entire Ummah of Islam. By the end of Hajj, you're literally walking on a foot of garbage. This is our contribution. A foot of garbage. They used to put garbage can. When I first went on the Hajj, they put garbage, huge garbage can. Nobody would ever use them. So the Saudi, they just said, just forget it. Why waste the time? Now they just come at the end of it with bulldozers. And bulldoze all of the garbage. Right? And this is the state. But it's okay, you go to McDonald's. Now McDonald's in Mecca. You go to McDonald's, you have your McDonald's hamburger, throw the paper on the ground, right, with the golden arches. And Colonel Sanders, outside of Bab Abdul Aziz, both names are problematic. But this is the, this is the state of the Ummah. So all of these things are happening, and amazing things. I mean, we're living in fascinating times. There's a Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Right? We are living in very interesting times, because there's extraordinary change happening in this Ummah. Phenomenal. At rates that become like the computer. It literally boggles the imagination and the mind. So this idea of... The, the second, to get back to it, this, this idea of Messiah al-Dajjal. The Messiah has the idea of the anointed one. The one who was anointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Messiah of the Jewish people, which we believe and confirm is the position of Isa alayhi salam in ul al-Azmi and from the great uh, Anbiya and Rusul. That he was given this position to call Bani Israel, the lost sheep. I was only sent for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. That sounds like it's a valid uh, piece of the Injil. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. All of their, we would call those hadith, hadith matruk, hadith mawdu'a. We don't know what they are. Like in the science of hadith, we have isnad. They don't have isnad for the Injil. So this group that was living at that time called the Ebionites, they were Jewish Christians. And these people were wiped out. Now Hans Kuhn, who is a German theologian, he was, he's Catholic, the Catholic Church has uh, accused him of heresy and different things. Hans Kuhn wrote a book called Christianity and the World Religions. He has a section on Islam. In this section, he admits that we must come to a fact that Jewish Christianity which disappeared in the the Quran in the Arabian Peninsula some of the Christian scholars in order to deal with this have said there must have been Ebionites that were living in the Arabian Peninsula and they leaked this information to the Prophet Muhammad fed during the persecution to the Arabian Peninsula they have no historical evidence for this none whatsoever and yet this is their claim so he admits this, Hans Kuhn, and in the end, after explaining that he recognizes that the original Christianity was Judaic, Semitic Christianity, had nothing to do with what later occurs, he says, in spite of all this, I'm not saying we should all become Jewish Christians, because what he means is we have to become Muslim, because that's the only place they have any historical link, is 7th century. He says, I'm not saying that I'm perfectly content with being a Hellenistic Christian. This is what he said. And the Catholics and all these things, right? And also, the Vatican have to give up all the gold that it stole from everybody. And that's problematic for them, right? It's one of the richest corporations in the world. The Catholic Church is one of the richest corporations in the world. It's actually a state, the papal state. They're the first state that recognized Hitler's government. It's a papal state. It's its own state. It's not part of Italy. So this is, this is the, the, the state of Christianity that, that, that takes place. Now what happens is, and Allahu alam, the formulation of all this is very complicated. You start reading about it, it gets more and more complicated. But there is a massive amount of evidence and documentation that has been published recently. Unbelievable. Most of this stuff was done in the 19th century. They don't like to admit this, that they've known this stuff for a hundred years. They don't like to admit this. The Tubingen School in Germany, they uh, completely discredited the four Gospels as valid sources, as historical documents. They recognize them for what they are as propaganda. 
propaganda tracks. I mean, this is, this is just fact now amongst the scholars, amongst devout Christians. You know, there's two types. There's the fundamentalists who don't uh, barely know how to read in the first place, but those who do know how to read choose not to read. They choose just to, that I believe this, the devil, um, devil's trying to trick me, the devil's trying to lead me astray, so I'm not going to listen to this. They consider the Muslims like devils. Once you start using logic and things like this and trying to, to bring rational argument to the discourse, it's a, this is inspired by the devil because it sounds good, right? And this is the way they look at it. And then there's the intellectual Christian who's in a crisis, so they become Buddhist, Buddhist Christian. They do Zen uh, meditation and uh, have ecumenical, you know, we're all one and peace and love and, you know, Muslims, let's talk about it. And, you know, it's all one in the end of the day. This is the other. This is the, the liberal. You have the, the right wing and the left wing. And this is, the, this, is the, this is where they go. They tend to go. The right wing and the left wing. Take your choice. Now, it's very interesting that when we as Muslims think of Isa alayhi salam, Nabi Allah, I mean that's, that's obvious. Ruh Allah. It's a very interesting term. Ruh Allah. What does Ruh mean? In Arabic, what's it mean? You, are, you look like you're Arab. What's, what's it mean? Ruh. Spirit. Now, the spirit is opposite what? What is the spirit opposite? The material, right? Isa alayhi salam is literally the embodiment of spirituality. He, ha- he does not have a worldly aspect. In fact, he comes back in the end of time to manifest elements of his worldly nature, including marriage. He did not get married. He, didn't, he hardly ate. He hardly slept. He's very different from our Prophet ﷺ. Our Prophet is not a worldly Prophet, but he partook in the blessings of the world, and he encouraged his people to do that. There is a sensual aspect of Islam that cannot be denied. We actually enjoy the sensory. We use scent. The Christians for centuries didn't, they wouldn't use perfume. They thought it was like from Satan. It was unspiritual. Right? I mean, look at what they do, the Rahbaniyyah in Christianity. That all comes from trying to emulate Ruh Allah. They try to become pure spirit, to completely get rid of their bodies. And this has led to neuroses in their cultures, deep neuroses about sexuality, about these. We didn't have these problems. Muslims have never had problems about these things. They were very natural. The Prophet spoke about these th- matters, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in very natural terms. He was not. He never used crude language, but he spoke about these things. He addressed the issues of, of making love to a woman to his followers, without any uh, shyness, as a part of legislation. Telling actually the Muslims should have muda'aba, have foreplay with their women. These things that our Prophet ﷺ taught us these things. He said, don't go to a woman like the camel goes to the she-camel. And just takes his pleasure and then goes away. No, treat your woman well. These things, this was part of his nature. If you look in the hadith of Imam al-Nawawi, radiallahu anhu, in the hadith about the bud'ah, that there's a reward in, in making love to the wife if it's halal, the Imam Nawawi says that the, the act of, of uh, making love is beloved to the prophets. Right? But Isa and Yahya, Yahya is Sayyidin wa Hasura. Somebody that doesn't marry women. And Isa is literally Ruh Allah. Why are they like this? I mean, why? part of the role of the messengers, part of what they do is they literally treat diseases. They're healers. This is part of their... Now, if the disease of a people is materialism, then in order to offset this gross imbalance, the prophets will often manifest... A deep spirituality, neglecting the materialistic aspects in order to bring their people to a middle path. This is what the Zuhad in Islam did. The Zuhad were group people that after the Sahaba, people started becoming into dunya so much, a group of scholars and a group of, uh, of people of taqwa, who, which were called the Bakka'un, they began to manifest. They wore uh, very coarse clothes. They ate coarse food. They were calling people away from dunya. They did this as a way of trying to bring the people back to a more middle way. And this is why you have to be careful with certain books that were written for this. 
Like Talbis of Iblis by Ibn al-Jawzi radiallahu anhu is a book that was written because of certain diseases that existed at his time of people going to extremes in the religion. He often goes to another extreme in order to find some middle way. And this is the contextuality of, of messages, not only of the prophets, but also of the scholars. Oftentimes the messages of a scholar of a certain time will not apply to another time because he was addressing the diseases of a specific time. Literally, many of the scholars that speak now, their words would be meaningless to people of a previous time. The Muslims didn't have inferiority complex. They don't know what that is. They didn't have uh, the idea that, you know, quit imitating the kuffar. The, the Muslims were imitated by the kuffar. Hindus wear turbans because Muslims wore turbans. I mean, people used to imitate the Muslims because they were the people of Izzah and the people of power. But now the Muslims, you see them imitating the Kuffar because they see them as being, they have Izzah, we want Izzah. This is what they want, they want to be like because being is being like. When you don't have an essence, Right? If you have no essence, you have no reality, like all these people out here that imitate pop stars and things like that, it's because they have no personality of themselves, they're empty people. So they take the shells of other people, because being for them is being like. They have no reality of their own. So if Michael Jackson wears one glove, they start wearing one glove. If Madonna starts wearing Ray-Ban glasses, they start wearing Ray-Ban glasses. And this is a disease. The Muslim didn't have that disease before. But now it is a disease, and so you'll hear this type of stuff. This had no application to people before us. None. So each age has. Now if you look at the message of Isa alayhi salam, his message is all about mot, akhirah, warning people about death. Look at the saying that we have in our own tradition of Isa alayhi salam. He says, dunya ma'bara. The dunya is a bridge, so quickly get across it and don't spend time building on it. These are from our own traditions. Beautiful sayings of Isa. The, the, the Muslims have often quoted, this is why Imam al-Ghazali in Ihya ulum al who was dealing with materialism of his age, often quotes traditions from Isa. Because of the deep spirituality that those traditions embellish. So therefore, the, the Antichrist would be the opposite of Christ. In other words, the extremist spirituality that is the Christian ideal because of their own prophet by his nature. He did not marry. That's why the highest ideal in Christianity is to be celibate. He did not marry. He ate very little food. That's why the monks used to fast and hardly eat anything. They withered their bodies away. Saint Jerome, who translated the Bible, read his writings. Unbelievable. I mean, Nietzsche says in the, in the Antichrist, he wrote a book called The Antichrist. He declared himself the Antichrist. <laughs> but he really did not like Christianity, and he actually praised Islam. But one of the things he says in that book, he said, just read the writings of these early people, and you can smell the stench of what an unclean lot these people were. He said, the Muslims are right in despising these people, because they, they, these are, this is not the religion of men. This is a religion of sick, enfeebled creatures. He said that Islam presupposes the existence of man. It is a man's religion. Which doesn't negate also the, 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 the aspects, the feminine aspects. It's not a negation of that. But the point is that the Muslims were people of rijal. Min al-mu'mineen rijal. Sadaqu ma'ahadullah alayhi. This is the mu'mineen. They were rijal. Min al-mu'mineen rijal. So the idea of, of the, the Dajjal is that the Dajjal will come and tell people in the same way that Isa a.s. told them that the next world is what you should work for, the Dajjal would tell them this world is what you should work for. In the same way that Isa a.s. told them that dunya is, is gharur, it's a delusion and it will delude you, the, the Dajjal will tell them the next world is a delusion. You see, like the beer commercial, you only live once, so get all the gusto you can. Right? That's a Budweiser. You only live once, you only go around once, so get all the gusto you can. This is the message of this age. It's a message of deep materialism. It is a message telling people they will be happy in, through buying things. Buy more and be happy. This is, this is a slogan. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Right? The smiley face. You know, we've had drought in California for years. They said it's a result of all these Californians saying, have a nice day. 
And then when rain came, to show you how diseased these people are, when rain came, everybody started cursing the rain. And they literally in drought for nine years. The, the governor of California said, this is a drought of biblical proportions. This is what he said, because they were in serious crises. And then massive rain, floods came, flooded. You read about that, right? All the floods came. I mean, alhamdulillah, I was living in a place, everything flooded all around it, except our little, alhamdulillah, I was very happy, I felt, alhamdulillah, because we have a Muslim community there, everybody else got flooded out, so Allah alam, inshallah, Allah, you know, preserve the Muslims wherever they are from the tribulation that He gives these people. And if it comes, alhamdulillah anyway, alhamdulillah ala kulli hal, if Allah wants to take us all by a flood, that's alhamdulillah, we're Muslims, this is not our problem, it's their problem. So this is the, the nature of the Dajjal. Now, look at some of the things that this modern society tells them. If somebody's a homosexual, now we have a book in, Cal- in America called the DSMR, right? The Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Diseases. Now, up till the last decade, homosexuality was considered a disease by psychiatrists. They literally considered it a disease. Freud, their big man, considered it a disease, right? What they did, they changed it. Now it's considered a lifestyle choice. Now, when it was considered a disease, there were a lot of people who were tortured by perverted thoughts and things like this. Now part of this from shaitan, we know that. You don't do wudu, you don't do ghusl. Shaitan has a lot of power to get in there and play games. One of the games he does is liwata. There are hadiths that indicate that shaitan yughri. He tries to get people to commit uh, liwata, the sodomy. They usually call it sod- sodomites. There's a nice word, sodomite. It's better than uh, gay. Gay used to be a nice word. Like he's gay, it means he's happy, Saeed. But now they've, they've ruined that word. But the, in the, uh, the idea of these people that were the, the sodomites, they would come to the doctor and say, I'm, I'm having sick thoughts. And they would try to do things to cure them. And some people did were cured. You know, they would work with them and they were cured. Now, what does he do? If a person having these problems, they have gay counseling. And they, they now in high schools in the United States, there's actually a Muslim, gay Muslim student association in Toronto, Canada. It's not a joke, you see. I mean, this is the sickness, it's the sickness. The Prophet said there would be liwata in his ummah. And he said there would be liwata of the glance, of the touch, and of the act itself, and they're all cursed. But this is part of the disease. Right? We don't believe in self-esteem. We don't want to esteem the self. We call the self nafs. Right? This is the translation of the word self is nafs. If you say izzatun nafs, right, with the Arabs, no, we don't want izzatun nafs. The izza is for lil mu'mineen, it's not for nafs. If the nafs is aziza, that's another thing. Right? If the nafs is aziza, that's another thing. But if the nafs is dalila, then you don't want to give it self-esteem and make it feel good about doing terrible things. So this is part of the, the, the deen, this modern religion of secularism. Now I want to go a little bit into, a little bit into where all of this is coming from. And I know some of this is review for people that have gone through this. But it, I still think for people that don't know, this is important to understand these things. This is a dollar bill, which is the uh, now devalued dollar bill. And on the back of the dollar bill, there's a seal on this side. It's called the Great Seal of the United States. That's what it's called. It's their seal. Now behind the seal, this is actually what is behind the Great Seal of the United States, is a pyramid with one eye. Now, the one eye is the sun god, Ray, which is where we get the word Ray, sun rays. It is the sun god, same Mithraic character, and he shows up again and again. This is the Masonic god of the, the Ray. If you look, you'll see the pyramid is built except for the top. It's built except for the top. The eye is suspended above the top. It hasn't come down yet. Because they believe until they've finished 
the Masonic project, which is the, the, what they say on the bottom, Novus Ordo Seclorum, and then Annuata Chapters, he is pleased with our project. In other words, the God they believe in is pleased with our project. What is the project? This is the question. What is the project that this God is pleased with? The project is literally the secularization of the world. To completely strip the world from religious beliefs. This is the project. And that is why it is called Novus Ordo Seclorum. A new secular or worldly order. If you translated that into Arabic, it would be a Nivam al Alami a Dunyawi. Not al Jadid. It would be a Dunyawi. The new temporal order. The new order of the world. And we know what Dunya is in Arabic. Dunya has a negative connotation in Islam. Unlike Alam, which does not have a negative connotation. If you read the Quran, Alam is not a negative connotation. Rabbul Alameen. Allah is Lord of the Alameen. We are part of the Alam. The Alam is the passive form of Alim. It's what is known. It is how we know Al Alim. The world is how we know Allah. We don't know Allah through Dunya. Dunya is the, the illusory nature of the world. It's the gharura. It's the aspect of the world that deludes you. Thinking that you're permanent. Thinking that you can transgress. Thinking that you're independent from Allah. This is the dunya. This is why the wife is not considered dunya. And the husband for the wife is not considered dunya. And food in order to keep your body healthy is not considered dunya. Money in order to work and spend on the halal and do your uh, responsibilities. None of those things by Islamic understanding are considered dunya. Dunya is the illusory element of the world. It's that element that takes people away from the akhirah. And this is shaitan's game. Shaitan's game is to take people away. Shaitan means to make distant. Dunya is near. He makes us feel that dunya is what is close, not akhirah. Islam tells us dunya is distant. One of the root meanings of dunya is to reach out for grapes that you can never grasp. Because this is the nature of dunya. You will never be able to get it. It will always evade you. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith sahih that's in the Riyadh al-Sariheen. He said, if the, the son of Adam, لو كان لبن آدم جبر من الذهب If the son of Adam had one mountain of gold, he would only want a second one. لا يمنع فاء ابن آدم إلا تراب قبره Nothing will fill. Or لا يشبع ابن آدم Ibn Adam will never be satiated. His mouth will never be filled except with the dust of his own grave. This is a deluded person. لا يغرنك بالله الغرور Don't let the deluder delude you. Don't let the deluder delude you. Don't let him think that this dunya is what is important. The message of Islam is the akhirah is important. Because you are muqbirun ala al-akhirah, mudbirun ala dunya We are heading towards the akhirah. We are heading away from the dunya. The akhirah in Arabic is called ajila because it only is realized through the ajal. Everybody has an appointed ajal. We have an appointed ajal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ حَتَّى لَا يَأْتِيَا لِكُمْ أَحَدُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجْرٍ مُسَمَّى فَأَصَدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ This is what the man says. Spend out from what Allah has given you. In other words, get rid of the dunya now. Spend now. Get rid of it now. So it benefits you later. And don't be deluded by it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because when the ajal comes, what's the human being going to say? Rabbi, la akhartani, if you just let me go back, delay this ajal, let me go back to the dunya. You're in akhirah now. Let me go back to the dunya. Fa'asaddaqa, I'll get rid of that dunya. I won't keep it in my pockets. Asaddaqa wa akum min as-salihin. And I'll be from the people of righteousness. Walain yuakhira, idha ja ajruha. Lain yuakhiru. نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجِرُهَا وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah will not delay this ajal. 
Allah will not delay it. When it comes to the nafs, Allah will not delay it. This is what the shaitan wants to make people believe. This is what the dunya wants to make people believe. That when you go into the malls, right, in America, the malls literally are telling people there's no time. You see, it's like Disneyland. If you go to Disneyland, which is part of the importing of the American religion, Mickey Mouse is probably going to be with the idols in, in hell, burnt, like these other idols. Because it's the seal of goodness in their, in their deen. If you go to Disneyland in the United States, it says, you leave today. You leave today and enter the world of yesterday and tomorrow. What is that? That's delusion. People live in the past and the future. Muslims are people who live in the present. Right? We remember, we, we remember now. Dhikr is not remembering the past. It's remembering Allah, which Allah is reality. Allah has no past and no future. Allah is reality. This is what Muslims remember. We remember quite literally the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Hadra huwa ma'akum ayna ma kuntum. Allah is with you wherever you go with His knowledge. This is the dhikr of the Muslims. We literally remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We do dhikr to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These other people drink liquor to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? I mean, we go, this is what, we go to this liquor store. They go to their liquor store to drink up and forget. We go to our liquor store, which is the heart, to remember Allah, not to forget. They want to forget because it's too painful. Once they start seeing things. They did a study, Omni magazine in the United States. 80% of, in this study, right, they love statistics. 80% of the people in their study that meditated, they, in other words, they closed their eyes, turn off the radio, turn off the TV, turn off the music. They closed their eyes, not to go to sleep, but just to still their thoughts. 80% had anxiety attack. This is true. And that's why they pump music in. Years ago, I was in England, and, and there was a farm, and, there was, uh, and I heard this rock and roll music blasting. And I went with somebody to see what it was. It was a pig farm. And they play the music for the pigs because they eat more. That's what the farmer told us. He said they eat, they eat more with rock music, they eat less with classical music. So they play rock music for them to eat more, to get fatter so they can sell them. This is what they do here. They play them all this music. They found, this is not a joke. When you go into store, I don't know, do they do this here? They play music in the stores? You know why they do that? They did studies and found people stay longer. They graze like animals. Allah says, Hum kal an'am. They're like cattle grazing. Bel hum abalu sabila. They're even more astray than cattle. Why? Because a cow, if it sees a car coming for it, it's going to get out of the road. I mean, the cow is not going to hang around. And with the cow, if you show the knife to a bull, he's going to charge you. He knows what's coming. That's why they have to stun them first. Right? But these people let them literally slaughter them. They go to the slaughter singing. Like the people, really, and I've just said this before. The, the Titanic, this is what we're on. We're on the Titanic. Welcome to the Titanic. We're on it. And they, they're, they're driving it. Oh, the Muslims are downstairs in the hall. We're not even on the deck. We're in the hall. And they're driving it. And they're headed right for the iceberg. And they're saying, this is an unsinkable ship. We're an indomitable species. We can't sink. We'll always find a way out. This is, this is our nature. This is what they say. When the Titanic left, it was declared the unsinkable ship. If you do that, Allah will sink it, just to spite it. You can't do that. When they made the challenger. Now, you know what challenger means in Arabic? Mutahaddi. It's a very bad word. Who are they challenging? They're sending it off into space. Who are you challenging? Challenging who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, look what happened. He'll just blow you up. That's what Allah will do, literally just blow you up. And then they say, oh, it's a, a tragedy. The seventh grade teacher riding on raw technology. They put a seventh grade teacher into raw technology. Thinking that they're qadirin alayha. Hatta dhanna ahluha annuhum qadirun alayha. They thought the people, they'll, they'll become so deluded. Allah says in Surah Yunus, they will become so deluded that they think they're all powerful over the earth. Right? So they take off on the challenger. Allah, they, you want to call it challenger? We'll see how long the challenge lasts. 
Like the, the user on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the, the, Allah says He declares war and His messenger on usury. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah in the hadith, the user, the banker, right? The banker, Lloyd's Bank, all these characters, they're going to be put in front of Allah. They'll all be given their swords by the angels. And then the angel will say, here's your Lord, now go to war. And how long are they going to last? They're going to slit their own throats. Ya laytani kuntu turaba. Oh, would that I was dust. The Prophet ﷺ saw them on the Isra and Mi'raj drinking blood in a river. Because that's the manifestation of the reality of their acts. The sensible world of dunya becomes the intelligible world of akhirah. The meanings become manifest. And this is the nature. This is what we know. We know the reality. They don't know it. They're being deluded. They're sleeping. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنَامُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ From his signs are your sleep during the night and the day. النَّاسُ نِيَامِ فَإِذَا مَاتُوا انْتَبَهُوا People are asleep and when they die they wake up. The Prophet ﷺ said, عُدُّوا أَنفُسُكُمْ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ Consider yourselves already dead people. In other words, wake up now. This is what deen of Islam is to wake up. This is the the, the, the Dajjal system of which the pyramid is coming near to their completion. Really, they really feel that it's very close. They're talking about world government, world federation. In our lifetime, we've seen entering into countries... Uh, and completely dissing the sovereignty of these countries without any respect for national sovereignty. That, that never happened historically. You realize that. Either people invaded as an act of war and aggression. But here, this is a world police. They're saying we're policing the world. Right? And there's hadith in Tabarani about the armies of the Jijal wearing blue hats, blue helmets. Now if you look on the... Uh, on the uh, if you look on the, the symbol, you see the earth, and then there's a spider's web, right? This is Bayt al-Ankabut. Allah says in Surah al-Ankabut, that they literally, they are those who take awliya, min duni dad, those who take shirk, take protecting friends other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are like the Ankabut, kamithri Ankabut, takhada bayta, the Ankabut that takes a house, and then Allah says, وَإِنْ لَأَوْهَنَ الْبِيُوتِ لَبَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ The weakest of houses is the spider's house. Now, what has enabled the one-eyed, and I, I'm not saying Dajjal is TV or computers or these type things. There have been these interpretations. Uh, it's very dangerous to make ta'wil of these type of things. And I, I don't adhere to that school. But I do believe that these are symbols and warnings to the Muslims. In the same way that the Prophet said in a hadith sahih, and the kulli jarasin shaitan. Every time you hear a bell, there is a shaitan. This is an indication that Muslims should not go to public schools. Because they use bells to call the children. You see, this is what happens. In the United States, do they use bells here? Do they use bells? You see, this is what they're indoctrinating the children into this system. But Muslims forget these hadiths. And if they know them, they just, oh, you know, oh, what a coincidence. No, that, this is something serious here. It's like Muslims that gamble with, with things like, oh, brother, we should, uh, you know, in the United States we have a big problem of sending letters to congressmen. Right? One man came to me and said, brother, two-thirds of the Congress agrees we should lift the arms embargo. It's only President Clinton that's against it. All of the American people are for it. Right? So write the letter to the Congress. I'm not going to waste my stamp. You know, really. Ibaat al mal is makru. To waste your money is makru. I'm not going to waste my stamp. Because this is what they do. They want us to gamble with... You see, it's a gamble. Well, maybe we'll win, brother. Right? But for me, that's a gamble. When I hear a gamble, I say, A'udhu Billah. I don't want, we don't gamble. Right? We either do something or we don't do it. But we don't gamble. And this is a big problem of the Muslim. That we lose insight into the, these things. So this, the Dajjal, the, the, the system that will enable this global network and global control is literally called the World Wide Web. Al-Bayt al-Ankabut al-Alami. That's how you would translate in Arabic. The spider, the worldwide spider's house. And they get the people on it like flies on the internet. They tell you here, what is a net? Is to catch you, to trap you. 
And this is what we do. It's a tool, brother. Use the tool. If the tool gets you in a vice grip, right? I mean, this is the nature of tools. They're either used for you or against you. And this tool is not in our hands. It's way, way past that. Which I'm not saying Muslims should... Yeah, I'm saying we should understand these things. Because I'm not advocating... I mean, I would like to see all these computers just uh, destroyed and people say, this, uh, that's anti-science, brother. This is anti-technology. That's retroactive. We're, we're, we should be progressive. No, look at the results of what this thing is doing to people. Has it enhanced our lives? Do you really feel life has been enhanced by these wonderful discoveries? Muslims have this idea of maslaha and mafsada, of benefit and harm, and they weigh things in the balance. I mean, the fact that they've proven now that sitting behind these computer screens for pregnant women have a much higher chance of spontaneous abortion. And that's something to think about in itself. That's only one measurement that's being measured. We don't know what the effects it's having on the brain itself. And television is another thing. So now part of this, the Dajjal, I've been given a few minutes uh, to finish this, but the, there are three dominant aspects to this Dajjal system. Of which I believe, according to the hadith, there will be a, a, a literally a world leader that's going to come. The first aspect is Fir'aun. Fir'aun, Haman, and Fir'aun, Haman, and his armies. The first aspect is Fir'aun. Fir'aun is the political system. The political system is the Freemasonic constitutional system of separation of religion, of any form of religion in the acts and decisions of the state system. In other words, morality is literally thrown out and Machiavellian principles are implemented. The principles based on efficiency and the benefit of the ruling elite. No other considerations are taken. If it means killing a lot of people, it means killing a lot of people. Lawrence Eagleburger, the Secretary of State, Acting Secretary of State of the United States, in Newsweek, when he was asked about the Bosnian matter, he said, this is a Greek tragedy, it has a beginning, it has an end, and a lot of people are going to die in between. That is a man who speaks Serbo-Croatian. He speaks Serbo-Croatian. He was the Yugoslavian ambassador. And he was there at Acting Secretary of State. They took Baker out, put him in as Acting Secretary of State when the whole Bosnian thing started, right? People didn't know he spoke Serbo-Croatian. I mean, this is complicity. And yet we hear the mouthing, the hypocrisy. The last four years they've been saying, if you do this again, we're really going to, you know, we're really going to let you have it. We're going to have to get serious now. And this is just, it's a ga- again, this game that the, they play with the Muslims. But we're in a deep trance, we're in a sleep. Now, that, the first aspect, the political, embodied by the constitutional government, separation of religion and state, which is implemented now in the Muslim countries as well. You see, they say the state religion of Egypt is Islam. Then why then are young Muslims, whether they're political activists or not, if they grow a beard and they go to the masjid for Fajr, they're either followed by police or they're put in prison. If the state religion, according to the constitution of Egypt, is Islam, then why are Muslims persecuted for being Muslims? Why? This is a question we have to ask. The state religion, all the Muslim countries have in their constitution, the state religion is Islam. Then why do they treat the Muslims the way they do, whether they're politically active or not? I mean, I'm not going to get into a debate about harakat and what, what's right, what's wrong. But I'm just talking about simple Muslims that grow a beard and want to pray in the masjid, they're persecuted. If you're an old man, you can go, it's not a problem. Once you're all bent over and they know you're not going to a jihad threat or something like that, right? I mean, even your takbir is pretty weak. They're not worried about it anymore. It's called ajuz. They don't care about the sheikh, that kind of sheikh. They care about other type of sheikh, not the old man. They're not, they're not worried about that. So this is the secularization of the world. This is what's happened. The next, and they're doing it in Saudi Arabia. You will see the secularization of Saudi Arabia is taking place. I mean, the Saudis have never really implemented sharia. They implement on poor people. That's called jahiliya. According to the Prophet, Hukum al jahiliya is that you aqam al had ala ba'if wa tarak al ghani. They apply the had punishment to weak people and leave rich people. That's jahiliya. That's not Islam. That's not sharia. Whether you cut off the hand or not. If population control is a type of seriousness. Who knows what they'll do? 
They tell us we're overpopulating. Read the, their own studies. They pay people in certain European countries to have children. Right? Do you know that? They pay people, white people, they pay them to have children. And yet they're sterilizing Muslim women all over the world. So if, if you're really worried about uh, population control, why don't you just bring some of those Muslims to your country? Every, all of these Muslims want to get passports and become part of the EEC. You'll get, you'll get lines of them outside the embassy. Just, we need population people, right? So they don't care about the earth. They don't care about the overburdening of population. No. They see brown people getting too many, Muslims getting too many. We have to scare them and say the earth's overpopulated. You can't bear this thing. And yet they pay people to have children. All right? This is, I mean, this is a reality. We shouldn't be fooled by these games. The, the next thing is the economic contamination. Haman is the economic power. This is the banking system. It becomes everybody has their plastic card. Right? This is the, the number. Everybody buys and sells with the number of the beast, according to the Christians. The Christians talk about the Antichrist. In their own book, it says they won't buy or sell unless they have the number of the beast. Your number is this number they give you on the plastic card. They have already have a move. The, the next thing is the economic control. You will buy and sell with the number. You have to have a number to buy and sell. Right now, they're still using currencies. They are moving already to eliminate currencies. They want to have debit cards. And there's already massive propaganda to convince people that this is to our benefit. If you think of the actual impact, and look, don't think this is, I'm fantasizing here. Seriously, this is happening before our very eyes. You are now in the United States. The vast majority of transactions happen with cards. You go into the grocery store, you use your ATM card. You go into any the gas station you have automatic gas you just slide your car through this is an absolute control the one eye that is watching everything has complete control the moment you slice that thing they know where you are all they have to do if they want to punch they put your number of your credit card which they all have access to there's no private property privacy all these things forget about that they study you they know where you shop. They know what type of books you buy. If you buy, they'll, they'll trick you into buying these preferred reader cards and things. You go to a bookstore, so you want to join up with the preferred reader. And then whenever you buy a book, they literally print in the books you're buying and then turn the card. This is what they do in the United States. And then they do statistical analysis of what type of people are reading what type of books. Because they want to know. The FBI in the United States, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, will check yearly what books were checked out in the entire United States with computer analysis. So they know exactly what books people are reading. And then they see what type of segment. That's why statistics, they love statistics, because they can work out, see what type of people are reading political books, what type of people are reading pornography. Now they know. And when you download on these things, not you, and I, nobody should be, but these people downloading pornography on their computers, they know exactly what they're watching. They know what they're watching in their houses. Out of the 20 most downloaded uh, uh, things, eight of them were pornographic uh, things that they were doing. You see, this is their great technology. So they have... All this wonderful, vast, extraordinary, complicated technology, and there they are, these people having virtual sex with their machines. I mean, this is, this is, asfal as Look at what the shaitan does to human beings. Turn them into pathetic creatures in front of electronic impulses stimulating their, their neurological cells until they, 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 they enter into this. I mean, this is pathetic. But this is their system. This is what it offers you. Virtual life. Virtual philosophy, virtual religion, virtual communities, virtual sex. This is all, no, we want the real thing. This is a Muslim want the real thing. We want human transaction. So the next thing, this economic thing of the Dajjal system is to eliminate money so that you only buy with the number. You, everybody has to have a number. And they're moving towards it. This will also eliminate free trade between people. In other words, you have to pay taxes on everything that you do. And I'm not advocating that you don't pay taxes. <laughs> Right? For people, you know, we're in the United Kingdom, we respect the laws. I saw on a television program, a Muslim telling them, we don't have to obey the laws in the United Kingdom. Where did they get that hukum from? Who, who, what, what alim gave them that fatwa? If you don't want to obey the laws, make hijrah to a place where, where you follow your own laws. If you're living in the United Kingdom, you obey the laws. That, this is Islam. Because it's for maslaha. وَالضُرُورَاتُ بِحَ الْمَحْضُورَاتِ It's an usul. Study your usul. 
But the, the point is, is that the economic system is being enacted within, I would say, Allah but between, within 10 to 20 years, uh, the, the money, this type of money, they're working out very day, night, night and day to f- find out ways of eliminating current, currency transactions between people. It's going to be hard, but this is what they want to do. The next thing is the military, which is Junuduhuma, the armies of Fir'aun and Haman. The, the, they have to have an army. This, the United Nations in the attempt to create a world army that will literally police people in the same way like uh, Noam Chomsky has mentioned it becomes like a mafia protection agency. If you're not paying up, then they send the mafia in to break some arms, break some legs. This is what they do. So that they have a, create a world army that will begin to do these things. Now where in all of this, all of these things that are happening, where then are the Muslims in the midst of it? We are the wrench in the works. I mean, literally, we are the wrench in the works. The, these three aspects that are mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions of Fir'aun, Haman, and the Junood, which these, this, this trilateral uh, aspect of control and domination, is you can see this again and again historically, but with, the, with this new world order, also along with the military uh, aspect of the Junood, or the minions, or the armies, is the propaganda war that takes place. And really, the, the, in, in the Western Hemisphere, this war has been going on for a very long time to literally control the minds of human beings, to take over the thought processes of human beings. I mean, we, uh, there has been massive studies since the 1950s in uh, mind control. The Americans became very interested in mind control after the Korean War war because of certain American soldiers that were uh, brainwashed during that period and that term actually begins to arise in um, it becomes a uh, in military jargon the idea of brainwashing individuals some of the American soldiers that were taken prisoner in the Korean War literally began to uh, propagate on the radio and broadcast to American troops communist propaganda and these things it turned out that they had been worked on very severely by um, Russian and Chinese uh, manipulators the Americans became very interested in this they wanted to understand what exactly was uh, taking place and they began to study this a lot they found certain uh, patterns in terms of brainwashing people one of them was repetition to constantly repeat over and over again and this is something that uh, the corporate world has taken up the idea of jingles in advertisements and these things continually this continual repetitive nature of advertising literally getting people to constantly uh, be reminded through jingles, oftentimes using rhyme jingles and these type of things. Also certain images. There have been studies that have been done in terms of the, the neurological effects of viewing pornography that are very frightening. And unfortunately these have been done at major universities in the United States. I don't know about the European research. The studies that have been done in, in Stanford uh, indicate some very frightening uh, results of people that watch uh, pornography. The effects that it has not only on behavior, what, they, what, what is termed cognitive dissonance, and the actual attitudinal changes that take place in order for a self to maintain integrity after being exposed to this constant sensual bombardment. So this is all part of this. Now Hollywood plays a very important role in this. And we can see the, the marriage uh, between the political and the, uh, the, the media aspects, especially in the United States. The, the politicians and the media people are, are very much entrenched in each other's business. Hollywood itself is a word, the word is interesting because it's a word that comes from a pagan, uh, uh, Hollywood is the holy wood. And it was the wood that the magical wands were made out of in the pagan uh, sorcery, magic. And these wands were believed that the sorcerers that possessed them could uh, put people into trances and control them. This is part of, I mean, this is symbolic, but it's also important to understand that part of what Hollywood literally does is it puts people into trances. It's a dream state. They call it the dream machine in the United States. And it creates fantasies for people. It puts people into these sleep. Now, one of the things that's interesting that in the 
part of what's done in movie theaters, in darkened uh, rooms where people watch television, is literally a, a trance state that occurs. It's what's called suspended state of disbelief. You enter into a state, you suspend your disbelief and enter into a, a state whereby you begin to believe what you internally realize is imagination. It's falsehood. Films are, are, are magic. It's just magic. You go and you watch these things and people get caught up in them. People cry during films. All this catharsis that takes place in these things. M many of the films, and, and this is an important element in the control mechanism, is literally allow people to go and have certain type of uh, catharsis as a purging experience. Which Aristotle talks about the, the, the necessary element. One of the necessary elements of tragedy is to create this cathartic experience. And this is why a lot of the films, especially also news and things like this, this is why news is very important in this culture. Everybody watches the news. They, watch, they have this tragic, cathartic experience of watching the tragedies of others and then feeling safe and complacent in their own experience of the suspended state of illusory well-being. So these are very intricate and sophisticated methods. Now, I, I think it's dangerous. The, although there are elements, that, there's concerted efforts that take place, there's also a lot of people that have similar worldviews that aren't necessarily working together in concerted efforts but the the corporate elite is a very small group of people they really are it's not a large group of people and these people definitely have very powerful agendas and they're working towards them and when I said that the Muslims are the wrench in the whole machine I mean, really, Islam is. The Muslims are, are in uh, the state that we... I mean, I don't need to go into detail about that. But these people recognize the potential threat of Islam. Uh, Brzezinski, who was the... Uh, the uh, National Security Advisor to Carter during the Carter period has written a book called Out of Control. And it's about the state of the world affairs right now. Out of Control. In that book he says that right now there is no, literally in the field of ideas, there is no potential uh, idea that could take on a mass movement uh, as a reinvigorating element in human societies other than Islam right now. This is what he says. That all of these other uh, philosophies and ideologies have literally fallen by the wayside and the, he said the vibrancy of Islam is still present and manifesting himself. Um, Elwood, who's a uh, comparative religions professor in UCLA, has written a book in which he says that he, he, he delineates five stages of religion. The first stage he calls the apostolic stage of the followers who spread the religion of the prophet or the founder of the religion. And then it moves into what he called the imperial stage. And then uh, it moves, and this is when the army, uh, the, the military aspect of, of religious conquest and these type things. And then he said it moves into what he called the devotional stage where they move away from the, their military conquests have been stabilized, solidified, and they begin to move into uh, uh, art and spiritual art and these type of things and then it moves into what's called the reformation stage whereby the, most, the, uh, the religious tradition whatever it is whether it's Christianity or something begin to reassess the situation that they're in and recognize the gross deviations that they've made from whatever their traditions were and the final stage is what he calls the folkloric stage or the superstitious stage when the religion is literally reduced to uh, a, a, a meaning uh, folkloric type of tradition that has to do with dancing and food and, and superstitious beliefs. And he says of all the world religions, his, his own analysis is that they are all in the... And it's in a reassessment of where the Muslims are. And he views this as a potential power in terms of literally a transformative power. Now... What I would just like to say in finishing all of this off is that in terms where we are as Muslims in relation to this big picture is that we are living in a time literally where the vast of people have manufactured ideas 
They have manufactured perceptions. People are literally their own internal experience of reality they have been deprived of. In the United States, which is probably more serious than, than Europe, I mean there's, there's a, more activity here. The American people are almost brain dead in terms of uh, the ability to critically think, to critically view what's taking place. They regurgitate the ideas that are given to them through the mass media. There's almost no analyses of what's going on in the United States and in the rest of the world. The few intellectuals that speak out are either very arcane, abstruse, they, they don't have, uh, they, they're unable to connect with the masses of people and are left to, uh, to uh, conferences uh, of limited amounts of people framework of the dominant culture. In other words, it does not question basic assumptions of the dominant culture. And this is one of the most effective techniques of this culture, is that it allows for debate to take place, but yet it's, it delineates and demarcates the boundaries of the discourse. And you are not allowed to step outside of those boundaries, in, for instance, and break polarization. If, 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 if they love to set up polarization. You're either a capitalist or a communist. There's no, that, that's it. That you're, they, they set the dialectic and then you are allowed to debate within the dialectic that they've already set. They have not allowed Islam into the discourse. They, they, uh, I mean, it's very clear. They do not allow Islam into the discourse. I find it fascinating that Hajj, which is the greatest gathering in the entire uh, world, collective gathering of human beings that takes place yearly, and yet in the United States it is never aired on the news. It's never aired on the news. They do not, they'll mention it in a very short thing or the beginning of Ramadan, they do not actually show the Kaaba, they don't show people circling the Kaaba. Just the visual picture of that is a very powerful experience for many people. When people actually see the Kaaba and see this circ circambulation of the Kaaba, they're overwhelmed. Non-Muslims, when they see it, it's very powerful. And yet despite that, we, we, they, they do not air it, they don't show it. And so there, there is concerted effort not to present the Muslim image. Another thing that they love to do is to take uh, extremist positions within the Islamic uh, Ummah and literally blow them up, put, give uh, uh, full uh, programs dedicated to looking at this, um, what they term quote-unquote fundamentalist type, fanatical, extremist, the angrier the better. They prefer very angry, vociferous people that are going to be shouting in the face of the camera and uh, throwing out all of this anger and wrath. And this is very effective in terms of, uh, of uh, presenting the Muslims as these kind of irrational people that really um, the stick is the only thing that's really going to work with them. So where we are as, as Muslims is we are dispersed, we are scattered, we, uh, we, we don't have as of yet a collective vision. It has not emerged. I mean, it, it's, it will by, by the promise of Allah and the Messenger. I mean, it will emerge. I, I don't have any doubts about that and I hope none of you do because the hadith is very clear that the Prophet Sallallahu said in the Sahih that after the Jababira, he said, ستعود, ستعود النبوة, that this uh, inheritance will return on the uh, methodology of the Prophets. So this, the Khilafah of the Muslims will return. This is by nature of the situation. When and how is another matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges us in each generation to rise up. To rise up in each generation and to establish this deen. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ This is the eternal challenge of the Qur'an. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ It's an imperative. The establishment of prayer. The, the unification of the Muslims in terms of community. This is a time literally our house is on fire. And we have to stop arguing about which channel we're going to watch. We need to s literally recognize that the house is on fire and it's been burning for a long time. We need to put out the fire and then we can decide what we're, how we're going to rebuild this house. But at this stage in time, anyone who is creating d uh, division, divisiveness amongst the Muslims is a shaitan. It's as simple as that. This is a shaitan. Those people that want to separate the Muslims through argumentation. We're not people of argumentation. Argumentation is a sign of error. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَا ضَلَّ قَوْمٌ بَعْدَ مَا أُوتُدْ هُدَى 
إلا ما ما ضل قوم بعد بعد الهدى إلا أوت الجدل. No people ever go astray after they've been given guidance except that it's replaced with argumentation. Argumentation is a sign of error. You know, Malik radiallahu anhu did not argue. If he was in a gathering and people began to argue, he used to get up and say, Harb, you're a war. And we're of salam. We call Darul Islam is Darul Salam, the abode of peace. We're calling each other to peace. If we want to talk about things, first of all, we should recognize who we are and what our capacities are. If we are not scholars, then we should not be debating issues that we really don't know anything about. I mean, Sharia is something, it is not something that everybody can talk about. There are certain basic things that everybody knows, it's called Al-Ma'lum min al-Din bil-Darura. And those type of things we all know, Khamar is haram. That's not a problem. But when we start getting into differences of opinion and these type of things, we have to recognize Amr ibn Ma'ruf and Nahi an al-Munkar is a maqam. Not everybody is capable of making Amr ibn Ma'ruf and Nahi an al-Munkar and the Quran itself uses a partitive particle in order to articulate that. فَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ umma. This minkum is tab'id, it's a partitive by the vast majority of scholars. Now this does not mean uh, condemning wrongs that are very clearly wrong. We're talking about those things in which there is difference of opinion. And the ikhtilaf of this umma, and I don't care, those people say this is a weak hadith, the ikhtilaf of this umma has always been a mercy amongst those who have knowledge. We, we do because Allah recognizes that Human beings have different capacities, cognitive capacities We understand things at different levels The Sahaba themselves had different degrees of understanding Abu Bakr's understanding is not the same as the rest of the Sahaba And there are many hadiths that indicate that And those core Sahaba radiallahu anhum That were around the blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They were not at the same They were at a much higher intellectual capacity Than other Sahaba Which doesn't mean there wasn't benefit in all of them and blessing. No, but those people became the leaders. They themselves had disagreements and yet they respected each other. Sayyidina Ali's fatawa differ from uh, Umar radiallahu anhu. The fatawa of Ibn Abbas are very different from the fatawa of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. This is a fact, historically. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu had different fatawa. So they themselves had different understandings. We should recognize that. That the Muslims do have different understandings, but they're within a generous framework. If people go outside of the framework, first of all, it is the job of the scholars to those rightly guided people who have the requisite knowledge in order to articulate these things to delineate for us what those boundaries are and when people go outside of those boundaries unless the boundaries are clearly transgressed in which every Muslim knows it but there are many things that only appear to be a transgression to one person and the scholar knows that in fact it's not a transgression but rather it is a acceptable and rightly guided opinion of an imam from the aima. and so we have to begin to unify this ummah I mean, this is the challenge of this time, is to begin to unify what has been separated. The, the, the kuffar have been dividing and conquering us for centuries. And we have to recognize that this is a game that we have to get out of. We have to just refuse to keep rolling the dice. Just say, no, we're not, we don't want to turn anymore. You play the game amongst yourselves. We're not going to play the game. They called the, the, literally the English Home Office, the British Home Office, and the French called the, the destruction and dismantling of the Muslim uh, Empire, of the Ottoman Empire, they called it the great game. That was the term that they used for it. It's just a game for them. Go and cause fitna amongst people. And Muslims should not fall trapped to these type of things. So we should recognize, first of all, that we are in a Dajjalic system. We are in it now, we are part of it, we are in it. We should recognize it for what it is and begin to, to, to do those things that will enable us to protect ourselves and our children. My recommendation to all of you is if... Now, I know that the brother is not going to like this, <laughs> his, but if you have a television... If you have a television, this is the most powerful tool that they have in terms of, of controlling people and disseminating their information. This is the most powerful tool that they have. If you are able to use your television for nothing other than useful things, then I would say, I'm not gonna, Allahu alam, I'm not going to make a judgment on that. But if you find yourself wasting your time, if you find yourself being entrapped by this machine and, and following the addictive patterns of the vast majority of people, then get rid of it. Just get it out. 
I mean, I, that's my advice to you, a sincere advice as a brother to you. Get rid of the machine because it's very powerful. It's addictive by nature. This has been proven. Read the Prince for Elimination of Television. There's many books that have been written that have proven that the quality of life of those people who have gotten rid of this machine has been enhanced. And they do not miss it. And this is a reality. And I, and I can attest to that because I've lived without that machine for several years. And I have no desire. It it's, it's really is a corruptive element. It will destroy your children. If you allow, it's like having shaitan as a babysitter. It's just allowing shaitan to take care of your children. It will sow corruption. Children that watch these programs, these are role models. They're watching uh, children that are grossly, what we call aql waridain, which is a kabira in Islam, is disrespect, filial impiety, gross disrespect towards your parents. This is one of the seven mubiqat. And this is what television teaches children. If you watch these programs, you will see that children are constantly arguing with their parents, fighting with their parents, undermining the authority of their parents. The basic message is, is that tradition is something that should be broken. Right? This is a message to the children. Tradition is something that should be broken. Because in the film, the, 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 the princess is not allowed to marry a poor person. It's against the law. And the father's against it. But in the end, she goes against her father. And in the end, the father accepts it. And this is the message. That if your father's against something, in the end, he'll accept you. So just go against him. Break authority. Do these things. This is a constant theme. So these are so-called, quote-unquote, innocent films being put out. You take your children to them. There's indoctrination going on. And the best propaganda is, the, is that which you don't recognize. This is the, the most effective form of propaganda is that which you are not aware of yourselves. So we have to be very careful of allowing... Uh, Neil Postman said that, that the, the Americans no longer need to send armies like the previous colonists do. They just send their television programs to colonize people. Because their whole message is consumerism. When I, we, on the way here, we had an Algerian brother we met who had a hat that said L.A. And I said, are you from Los Angeles? I didn't know. He said, no, I'm from Algeria. I said, well, it's almost the same now, right? And he said, he said, where are you from? I said, Los Angeles. I mean, I'm technically from that area. And he said, Los Angeles. Put his thumb up. The best place. I said, oh, you've been there? He said, no, but I've seen it on the, t the movies. You see, and this is it. I met one Muslim Arab in a Muslim country. He told me that he, Ana Marib, wa Amrika Shifai. He said, I'm sick and America's my cure. And really, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, they believe this. And this is the effectiveness of the propaganda. This is the effectiveness of the propaganda. So we have to recognize it for what it is. Begin to pull our children out of this system. We have to develop our own school system. And don't put Islamic school. You, why do you have to put the Islamic school? Just private school. I mean, a lot of this problem that Muslims are having in England is over this religious issue. Get your children out of the public schools. Get them out of the public school. Get them into your own schools. If you're going to stay here, you have to do that. It's imperative. Because the school is the process of indoctrination. It is not a neutral educational system. It is based on a complete indoctrination of your children. You said that Muslims have to obey the law of non-Muslim countries they happen to be living in. Is this true of Muslims in Muslim countries where Islam is, is not being implemented? Then you get into what's called khuruj an sulta there's ahkam that are related to that. If you are living in a country where the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not being implemented, you have two choices. One is to make hijrah. Now, if there's no place to make hijrah to, I asked a sheikh that I studied with, Usul, Sheikh Muhammad Mahmoud Wal Zaydan, about the obligatory of making hijrah from America. Because there have been fatwas that have been written on that. A close friend of mine, uh, who's a scholar, wrote a fatwa and actually gave it to me. And uh, I asked him, and he said that in, from a classical Islamic perspective, there's no basis for living in those countries. But he said, but this is an age that has bewildered the, the scholars. And he said, and those of us of lesser capacity are even more bewildered. So it's a very problematic time, what we're living in, these situations. But we, there, you cannot bring the dharar to yourself. You know, you cannot bring harm to yourself. It's part of the sharia. 
that if you're living in a place to go against their laws will bring harm to you, that is haram to do that. And, and Muslims that openly reject the law of this country are not only placing themselves in a, a, a dangerous position, they're placing other innocent Muslims in a dangerous position. So there, there's, no, there's no tabrir for that, to say we don't obey the laws of that. No, you make hijrah. These are laws, you came into this country with Amman, if you weren't born here, you came into this country with Amman from the Dola, they gave you a, a passport, a visa, or however they, but they let you in. Part of the condition that coming into this country is they expect you to adhere to the laws. And we are not uh, people that are, uh, we don't cheat and we're not treacherous people. We're people of Amana, and that is an Amana, and our, we're not like the Jews. See, the Jewish religion, they say you can cheat the Goyim, it's in their Talmud. They say you can cheat the goy. We're not like that. We don't do that. No. The, the Muslim and the non-Muslim have the same rights in, in that respect. You don't cheat a non-Muslim because he's a non-Muslim. I mean, subhanAllah, what kind of deen is that? What kind of ethic is that? Where you have a double standard. This, this is the religion of barbarians. And so about khuruj and sulta, this is a big problem in the Muslim world right now. Because we have Algeria is in a state of civil war. We have Egypt is on the verge of a civil war. We have Iraq. I mean, it's unbelievable situations. These are all, it's a tragic uh, conditions. And, you know, the, I mean, the, we, Muslim, we have to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, we have to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَيْفَ مَا تَكُونُوا يُوَلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ I mean, how you are, so are the people put over you. And unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle because النَّسُ عَلَى دِينِ مُلُوكِهِمْ And both meanings are the same. People are on the deen of their kings, but also kings come out of the people's condition and state. I mean, Allah doesn't change people from a good condition to a bad one, be, except because of their own internal changes. And that goes for khair and sharr. Why are we all living in the Dajjal system and not an Islamic state? Before you get Islamic state, you have to be in Islamic state state of mind. You see, everybody, we want Islamic state, nobody wants to get in Islamic state of mind. People sit around in coffee houses talking about the great Islamic state. And, and they're not in the masjid learning how, what you're going to do when you have this great Islamic state. I mean, ask somebody what a hukum is. What do you, what's the economic system of Islam? We become a ummah of slogans. That's what we are. Islam's the solution. Takbir, Allahu Akbar. Tayyib. There, well, there's the menu, where's the, where's the meal? Where's the meal? Let's eat it. You know why? Everybody, you just put out the menu. That's all they do. Put out the menu. Oh, it's very tempting. Right? This is a slogan religion now. That's what we've become. Simplistic, sloganistic uh, people that have no depth, no in-depth analyses. No, we need to learn our deen. And the deen is an incredible system of renewal. It, our usul is so brilliant in that it allows in any situation for Muslims to act. It, our usul allow us to actually do things in this country now. But we have to learn our deen. We have to become people of ishtihad. Muslims are people of ishtihad. I mean, Muslims were mujahidun, mujtahidun. Why are we all living in Dajjal system and not Islamic? That's a good question. How can a person stress the importance uh, and reality of the Dajjalic system as a lot of Muslims treat it as a myth or a system far away from Muslims or their country? And this is true. The Muslims do not take this thing seriously. It's like a joke. And one of the hadiths is a beautiful hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said that there will be people from my ummah that say, let's go down and check this a'war out, the Dajjal. Let's go down and look at him. And the Prophet ﷺ said they'll go down and become maftunin. They'll get sucked into his fitna. Right? I and mean, seriously, let's go down. Let's check what's on the TV, bro. <laughs> Turn it on. Then you're sucked into the system. So people should not take the... And don't take the TV lightly. Really. It's not a joke. They do millions of dollars of research on how to control you. This is not a joke. They have degrees in psychology of mass communication. They study. They do statistical analysis. You see these people do these uh, polls... And only retarded people will stop and talk to these people because they're just trying to find out information to manipulate you more. Uh, how many times a week do you shop here? Um, 
what's your favorite? What kind of car do you drive? What's your... And they're just... They want to get information. Find out what you're about. For instance, they discovered that most people turn right going into uh, stores. So where do they put all the expensive stuff? On the right side. And then they put... And this is the type of thing. It's a deep... They have studied the self. Psychology. Behavioralism. They've studied it very deeply. And this is what they do. They manipulate people. So don't think a commercial is funny. Right? That people laugh. That's what they want you to do. Laugh while they're indoctrinating you. And then you're walking down the store and wondering why you're picking that brand. I would like to know whether the hijab is traditional or religious. And if women don't wear hijab, are they going to hell only for that? Uh, to not wear the hijab, nobody can say anybody's going to hell. Nobody can say that. It, it, the, the hijab is shar'i. There's no doubt about that. It's not traditional. There are traditional forms of the hijab, which is a different matter. But the hijab itself, the covering, wearing the jilbab, is it's part of our deen. You know, and women that... If they, they're not doing it, they should just recognize that they're in a state of ma'asiyah like many things. The ummah right now, we're all in a state of ma'asiyah. And the, the, the woman taking off the hijab is only a symptom of a much deeper disease. It's a symptom of a much deeper disease. The woman was honored in sharia by the hijab. The hijab, That's what, that is the illa of the hijab, that women are not treated as sexual objects. That is why Allah gave women a hijab, to honor them. If they choose to dishonor themselves, that is their choice. The idea of Muslims going and throwing acid on women, and this has happened. This is sick. I mean, this is just sick people. And the truth is, in an Islamic system, in traditional Islam in Medina, there were women walking around bare-breasted. And that is a fact, historical fact. And you can read it and look it up in the books. Sidna Umar radiallahu anhu did not allow uh, the imam to wear the hijab. He did not allow them to wear the hijab. So there were uncovered women in Medina. That is a fact, historical fact. Muslims should get out of this obsession with women. Really, it's just a sickness in our own hearts. You lower your gaze. If the sister's not wearing the hijab, her husband should be responsible for that, her own family. You can give somebody nasiha, but you just lower your gaze. And we're living in a society, people walking around naked. You know, and we're worried about somebody not wearing a, a, a scarf on her head. I mean, go out there and look at these animals out there. Seriously, go out there, look at them. Unbelievable. I mean, people really. And the other thing is, the hijab, a lot of Muslim men, they make it a hijab between a woman and her iman. I mean, you're, not all of you acting like sahaba. And yet, we want the women to act like sahabiyat. And also, another thing, I challenge any of you, just wear a, a robe and a turban one day out here. Go, just go on and experience what it's like to be identified as a Muslim. A lot of you, I don't know, you, you, you could be Hindus or whatever. In terms of these people, their perception of you. But when you wear something that identifies you as a Muslim, that itself is putting yourself in their face. And for women it's a lot harder because they have a stereotype that they're stupid, they're backward, they're ignorant, and that's the message that they're being given. They're, they get stares, they get laughed at. Go out and experience that. You see, put your turban on, put your robe on, and go out and drive on the subway, get on the tube, and do those things, and just get the feel of what it's like for people to stare and look at you and do those things. We should have more compassion for our sisters. Well, light, we should have more compassion for our sisters. And, and, we, and the reason why a lot of women leaving Islam is because we're chasing them out of Islam. And that's the truth. And every time has its place. We should know the time we're living in. I mean, it's very difficult to be a Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, it's like the Qabid al-Jamra. It's like holding on to hot fire. And we're in that time. If you don't think it, then you're just deluded. This is the age we're living in. So we have to have mercy on our sisters. Really, we have to uh, have mercy on them, defend them and protect them. Because they're out there on the front lines and these are, there's a bunch of wolves out there. It's a society of wolves. And they, that's what they prey on, innocent people. And our, and our women, they have a lot more innocence than their women. And they recognize that and that attracts them. Because they're sick. That attracts them. Muslim women have innocence, even the ones not wearing hijab and things. Because they grow up in a, in a cleaner atmosphere and environment. And we should do our best to protect that innocence and to guard those women. They're our responsibility. They're our, that's the dhimma of the Muslim male, is to guard and protect his sister. Uh, what's your protocols of Zion? Allahu Anam. You know, the, I mean, it, the book is... Uh, 
I don't think it should be censored, which is what they do. You can't buy that book in bookstores, things like that. I mean, books should be out there. They should be, people should be able to read books. Whether it's true or not, a lot of people say the Russian secret police during the Tsar's time uh, forged the documents. Allahu Alam. I mean, there's certainly, there's very interesting things in it and things like that. But again, I think we should really get out of this whole conspiratorial, uh, you know, this conspiratorial everything. I mean, this is a sign of munafiqeen. يَحْسِبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةً عَلَيْهِمْ they think every little thing that happens it's against them Muslims just get out there and do our job you know وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَذَاكْ and then you're just patient about the harm that Allah sends to you because any harm that befalls us is from Allah and it's a test for us to see أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلَ so alhamdulillah we shouldn't be again obsessed with these things but again we should recognize who that, that we do have people out there that are they are avowed enemies we also have people out there who are not Muslim that are not avowed enemies and we can easily turn them into enemies because of our own lack of wisdom you see I mean there are people out there that are either neutral or they're, they're, some of them support the Muslim they're not Muslim but they actually support them and I've met them and, and many of them will become Muslim if they're given the opportunity but we have to use hikmah and these type of things and we have to understand you know that we do have people out there that will that, that, that will uh, respond to the call of Islam it's deen al-fitrah but if it's not presented the Allah says in the Quran رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Oh Allah don't make us a tribute tribulation for the kuffar in the Jalalain how did, what does he say that means he said it means that we become losers and nobody wants to join us that's the fitna that we can become for the kuffar who wants to join that religion it's a religion of a bunch of losers Islam is a deen of futuhat Look at the Prophet ﷺ. People became Muslim after Badr because it's success. Nothing like success to breed success. People see that it works, they join it. But you see a bunch of losers. Who wants to hang out with a bunch of losers? So we have to become people of futuhat, people of success. And success is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, these are, a lot of this is just my own uh, understanding and things like that. People can disagree. I don't have a problem with that. I don't like to argue. But people, we all have different understandings. I'm presenting a certain understanding based on my own uh, research and, and knowledge. So inshallah, if it was useful, it was useful. The best qaida that I found in the Quran for the Muslims to follow, الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلَ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَ Those who listen to things and يَسْتَمِعُونَ is a reflexive. In other words, you internalize it. Not يَسْمَعُونَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ They think about it. They internalize it. So listen to things, think about it, and then... Take what the best of it and leave the rest. Jazakumullah khairan wa salam alaykum.